So today we are going to learn about the second part of the interwar years, the years between World War I and World War II. We're going to talk a lot about the Great Depression today. So our three daily objectives are, number one, explain why the Great Depression started, number two, explain why the Great Depression impacted the world, and three, define the term fascism. So the first big interwar change was with technology. All of that technology that had been used in World War I, like tanks and airplanes and machine guns, was being changed in such a way to be beneficial to civilian life. Um, so the automobile, for example, transformed life because it allowed people to commute and travel. For the first time, people didn't just live their entire lives where they were born. They could go across country. They could even go across the ocean via airplanes. Um, and the inventions of radio and television changed the way that people communicated. Uh, someone sitting in Washington, D.C., for example, could give a radio side speech to people all across the United States of America. This was highly efficient and much more effective than telegrams or, or in any of the older ways of communicating. Another big innovation that happened across the Western world, so the United States, Great Britain, France, was women gained the right to vote. Great poster over here on the right, women bring all voters into the world, let women vote. So women, half approximately, of the population of democracies across the West um, were finally allowed to vote. So we've got a number of technologies, we've also got women voting. Uh, if we look at the political side of things, only Japan and the United States of America came out of World War I better than they were before. Uh, and this is largely because Japan and the USA were the ones who, by all accounts, paid for the war. Um, European countries went bankrupt quick. And when they went bankrupt, they needed money to keep their economies flowing, so they borrowed. They borrowed heavily from Japan and the United States. And this is what kept European countries going during the war and after. Um, this got even worse after World War I. The countries of Europe went bankrupt. Um, they had suffered huge population losses. And in order to get their countries back on track, they had to borrow. And they borrowed from the United States and Japan. Many of the multi-ethnic empires uh, were broken up after World War I. And they struggled to establish democracies. So we look here, this used to be Austria-Hungary. Now we've got Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Yugoslavia all kind of sort of broken up into different countries. The Ottoman Empire has been broken up into Greece and Turkey and Bulgaria. Uh, Cyprus is, is, is its own thing now. Ukraine, no longer part of Russia. Poland has been cut from Germany. Uh, we've got all the multi-ethnic empires have been broken up. Germany, things were bad. Ger things were really, really, really bad. Um, to pay for the war, Germany had just started printing money. They couldn't, they couldn't get loans from the United States and Japan because they weren't allied, so they just started printing money. And this caused severe inflation. There was too much money, too many slips of paper, following too few goods. Uh, and this continued after the war, largely a result of the reparations payments that Germany was forced to pay to France and Belgium as a result of the war, and according to the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, just to give you an example, in 1918, a loaf of bread in Germany cost less than one mark, their version of a dollar. By 1923, so five years later, a loaf of bread cost 200 billion marks. You can see this picture over here on the right with lots of children and their dog just playing with stacks and stacks and stacks of money that was absolutely worthless. Uh, people would um, wallpaper their houses in money um, in order to, I mean, clearly you can't take $200 billion to the grocery store and buy a loaf of bread because how are you going to tote $200 billion? But there would be people walking around with wheelbarrows filled with money trying to buy things. Uh, it was a mess. Germans blamed their new democratic government, which was forced on them after World War I, known as the Weimar Republic for its misery. The Germans felt like they did not lose the war, that their government had given up, and that it was the new democratic government, it was their fault, that their lives were much worse than before the war. 
As a result of all these loans, by the late 1920s, the world's economy depended on the U.S. economy. Um, unfortunately for the world, the U.S. economy crashed in what is known as the Great Depression. So the reason why the Great Depression happened in the United States is fairly simple. What it comes down to is the Industrial Revolution, which had made all of these fancy technologies and created all of these goods, put all of the money into the hands of the rich. So the rich made money off of producing goods. They used their money to buy more capital, more land, more companies, more technologies, which made the middle class ultimately poorer. So the rich had gotten rich from the Industrial Revolution. The poor had gotten poorer. And eventually, the poor and the middle class were unable to purchase the goods that the factories made. If you're broke, you can't buy a new pair of Jordans. You just can't. And the Jordan factory has to shut down because nobody's buying Jordans. This is what happened. This is why the Great Depression happened. This leads to a huge economic downturn. The rich people are no longer producing because their goods aren't selling. Things are not cycling anymore. The Great Depression happens. Now, Wall Street, New York City, was the financial capital of the world, again, as a result of all these loans that the, that the countries of Europe had taken out in the United States. In order to try and make some money, the middle class, middle class people, people like Mr. Hodges, began buying stocks on margin. Basically, in order to buy a stock, so a share of a company, they were taking loans. They would say, I got $5, this stock costs 20 I'll take a loan for 15 and one day when the stock is worth 100 I'll sell it and pay my loan back and make some money. Except in September 1929, a bunch of wealthy investors decided they were going to get rich quick. They were going to sell all of their shares, which would tank the price of stocks. Then they would be able to buy up a whole bunch of other stocks. And then once the price went back up, they'd be able to sell all of them for a huge profit. They miscalculated. They sold so many stocks that everybody got scared. Everybody thought that the, that the stock market was really crashing. So then everybody started selling stocks. And next thing you know, the stock market really was crashing. And middle class people, at the end of the day, got stuck with these stocks that were worth a dollar after they had got a $15 loan on it. So they had spent more money and they had a loan that was worth more than the stock's value. Um, on Tuesday, October 29th, some 16 million stocks were sold. This leads, in addition to the fact that all of these stocks have been sold on the margin, uh, leads to a total economic collapse in the United States. Over here on the right, we see a, people, we see a group of people lined up trying to get their money out of the banks. Um, Stocks that people had brought on margin were worthless. People owned thousands of dollars to stockbrokers. Not good, not good. Companies began laying off workers. Profits declined. Factories shut down. The economy was collapsing. We look at that picture on the last slide with the line. People are trying to get their money out of the banks because at this point, the banks are not insured by the federal government. So these banks, just like all these other companies, are publicly traded. You go buy a stock for that bank. The problem is, if the bank has used all the money to buy stocks, which is what they did, then you'd line up to get your money, and there wasn't any money there. The bank said, sorry, we're out of money. And people said, but you were still, you had my money. And they would say, sorry, we don't have any money. And then, because of the Great Depression, the banks went out of business. And the people who had stored all their money in the banks no longer had any money. It was just gone. It just disappeared. This is what happened to some 9 million people. Some 9 million people lost their savings because the banks had lost their money. That's why a lot of your grandparents or maybe your great-grandparents probably still hold money under mattresses. It's because they're terrified that the banks will shut down and lose all their money. That won't happen nowadays. The federal government insures up to $100,000 of your money stored in banks. By 1933, approximately a quarter of American workers were unemployed. Not a great day. Not a great day. This chart on the right is pretty cool. You can kind of see how it works. So you see the stock market goes up into October 1929. Then it crashes. 
Then a whole bunch of people say, hey, it's so cheap, let's all buy. They buy. Price goes up. Then people stop buying. It goes back down because it was actually worthless. And then it goes down and down and down and down and down and down. That's the Great Depression. Now, in an effort to improve the U.S. economy as a result of the Great Depression, USA imposed tariffs on foreign goods. They say if you're gonna if if you're gonna bring Volkswagens from Germany, we're going to put a special tax on that because it's not made in America. Problem with tariffs is that other countries do it too. So U.S. starts putting tariffs on foreign goods. Foreign countries start putting tariffs on American goods. World trade drops some 65% in just a couple years. Um, based around U.S. demand, economies around the world fell. People in the United States don't have the money to buy things anymore. So they're not buying things from other countries or the United States. So now other countries' factories are shutting down. Finally, Britain and France enacted tough reforms. For example, they raised taxes on the rich. Germany, Austria, and Italy were not as fortunate. They were not able to raise taxes on the rich. The U.S. does not raise taxes on the rich. The Depression gets worse. Over here on the right, we see this great image. Uh, we see Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president, sitting in the United States, and all these babies that are representing European countries are crying because you, the United States is no longer giving Europe the loans it needs. And Italy and Germany, uh, unable. For, first off, they have very young democracies that are not that are not experienced in dealing with crisis. Um, so while in Great Britain and France they enact reforms like they increase taxes, Germany and Italy are not capable of this, and instead they have this thing called fascism show up. Fascism basically is an extreme form of militant nationalism. We've talked about nationalism over and over and over again. Probably the most powerful force in the last 300 years. Fascism is, is like that on steroids. Um, one of the big components of fascism is that people are going to pledge their loyalty to an authoritarian leader, so a leader who has all of the power. It's kind of like, like an absolute monarch, except power is not inherited, um, but the leader does have all the power. Most people who support fascism are aristocrats. Again, they're used to monarchies. They like they like tough guys as leaders. Industrialists, people who want to start making money again. War veterans and the middle class. The middle class have largely disappeared as a result of the Great Depression. They wanted to be back in the middle. They didn't want to be poor. Unlike communism, uh, fascism is a national movement, not an international movement. With communism, remember, it's all about the workers revolting, and that's all workers, workers across the world. In a fascist country, because it's an extreme form of nationalism, again, it's a national revolution, not an international one. Uh, the first fascist party forms in Italy as a result of inflation and unemployment. Uh, we see a picture of some fascist soldiers in Italy over on the right with Benito Mussolini marching in front. So Benito Mussolini is going to take power in 1922. He's going to outlaw all other political parties, so only... The fascist party is allowed to exist in Italy. He formally ends the democracy in Italy. He's going to jail his political opponents. He's going to force radios and TVs to broadcast fascist Italian propaganda. Benito Mussolini's on the right, Hitler's on the left on that picture. Uh, in Germany, kind of sort of similar, Adolf Hitler fought in World War I, received two Iron Crosses. He joined the Young Nazi Party in 1919. Uh, it was an incredible order. He's a great speaker, in other words. He's a great organizer. He becomes leader of the party. Um, after the Great Depression, Depression strikes in Germany, Germans turn to Hitler for security. He is formally appointed Chancellor of Germany in 1933. He soon after establishes an authoritarian government in Germany. Over on the right, we see a great chart that explains the rise of European fascism. Uh, notice in the middle, that middle line is the Great Depression. So that's, I mean, that, that kind of tells you that this is where all of this comes from. Take a few seconds, a couple minutes, whatever it takes. Answer your daily objectives.